For decades, China has been a global leader, right from their tourism to inventions, and even being a leading country in the Olympics. China is up there at everything. Well, their architecture is no different, because today we're going to talk about their $62 billion north-south water transfer project. What's so special about it? Why does it cost so much? And how does this help China? Hit that like and subscribe button, and let's find out. First, let's start off with understanding why China took up this magnificent journey. For years, China's north, which includes megacities like Beijing and Tianjin, have suffered from severe water crises. The north takes around 50% of the country's population and two-thirds of the farmland, yet it only has about 20% of China's total water resources. By sharp contrast, southern China is rich in water resources, with many rivers flowing abundantly, such as the Yangtze and Pearl. This has put an enormous burden on agriculture, industry, and urban living in the north. So what did China do? The solution was literally to move water from the south to the north. Seems pretty reasonable enough. Imagine diverting whole rivers over thousands of kilometers. Sounds like something that would happen in a fairy tale, right? But for China, this was a must. And so the South to North Water Transfer Project was born. By the way, this is not anything new in transporting water. The concept itself was born back in the 1950s when Mao Zedong himself suggested from the South, water could be transferred North. At the turn of the early 2000s, the plan really started to take shape. Fast forward to today, and the South to North Water Transfer Project is very much underway, with two of the three main routes already in use. Now, let's break down these routes. First, we're going to talk about the Eastern Route. This route is the oldest part of the project and incorporates the use of existing canals and rivers, much of the course passing along the route of the ancient Grand Canal to carry water from the Yangtze River northwards. After more than 1,150 kilometers, which is about 715 miles, the eastern route supplies water to cities such as Beijing, Tianjin, and even industrial areas. Not that the eastern route was always about digging new canals per se, but there was so much to do in the form of upgrading the old canal system. Dozens of pumping stations had to be built to push water uphill. Yes, uphill. Imagine the amount of energy that would be required to pump millions of cubic meters of water a certain distance and elevation. This is a super important route for both the industrial and agricultural sectors in northern China, and it's been anything but easy. The eastern route passed through highly polluting regions, transporting its water through extremely densely populated and industrial regions. China had to go on and implement a huge water treatment along the course of its carriage, so by the time it reached its end users, the water would already be usable. It is a technological and logistical feat on a scale that is quite hard to comprehend actually. Another major issue the Eastern Route had to deal with is to ensure a consistent amount of water, particularly during drought or low rainfall in southern China. The engineers had to keep observing the level of water and devise ways in which there will be enough to meet the North's burgeoning needs. In some case, strict water rationing had to be enforced in the southern China as a way of ensuring that the North gets a substantial supply. Next we're going to talk about the Central Route. This particular route is a very crucial one to the project and is often called the backbone of the whole project, transferring water from the Dongjianko Reservoir on the Han River, a tributary of the Yangtze northwards over 1,400 kilometers away. The central route is the most expensive and complicated part of the whole project that's designed to carry an incredible 13 billion cubic meters of water annually. That's an amount that is really hard to even envision. Among the major challenges that faced the central route were issues to do with elevation. The water had to be moved across mountains, and this involved the creation of huge tunnels and channels to maintain the flow of water. Even more amazing is that it had to cross major infrastructures like highways, railways, and existing cities. Lots of innovation had to be carried out to the tunnel underneath or around them without inconveniencing the day-to-day -day lives of millions of people. First water deliveries began in 2014 via the central route, which has been key in ensuring supplies of water to Beijing and other major cities. Previously, the capital city was not assured of preventing gigantic economic and social disruptions because of the impending water shortages. With this route, Beijing today has a far more stable water supply, though challenges still remain. A major plus for the central route is that it supplies water to large-scale agriculture in the northern regions, which have been suffering for years from drought and over-exploitation of local water resources. With a steady supply of fresh water from the south, farmers in the north can maintain crops more effectively to assure food security and stabilize the region's agricultural economy. It means so much more than just water delivery. It changes the paradigm in which the country approaches food production and rural development. 
In addition to this, the Central Route supplies the needs of millions in urban areas. Growth in northern China is rapid, and if not for this supply of water, the cities would not have been able to keep pace with the growing population and industrial advancement of these people. The Central Route provides a base for cities such as Beijing and Taijin to prosper and take some of the stress off the local resources in the area. The third route is the Western Route, and is still on the drawing boards as being one of the most ambitious of it all. It would channel water from the headwaters of the Yangtze and the Tibetan Plateau, across high mountains and treacherous terrain, to arid regions of the northwest, including the Yellow River, while the eastern and central routes make use primarily of existing waterways. This will be one huge deal, considering that its making involves laying tunnels and infrastructure through the Tibetan mountains, one of the most remotest and rather inaccessible parts of the world. The Western Route is envisioned to address the arid region's demand for water, highly essential for agriculture and energy production. This stage, however, creates immense environmental issues. Fears are that disturbing the Tibetan Plateau's fragile ecosystem may lead to unforeseen changes, not only for China, but also in some countries downstream. That said, if successfully done, the Western Route would fundamentally change China's water security outlook and guarantee supplies of the precious resources even to the most water-stressed regions. Given the sheer scale and difficulty of the engineering involved, we remain years, if not decades away from seeing this phase completed. The Western Route will also play an important role in stabilizing the industrial base of the Northwest. This region provides many critical coal, gas, and renewable energy projects to help China meet its energy needs. A secure supply of water means that these industries will increase in this region, furthering China's energy security. However, let's talk about the environmental and social challenges. Because the South to North Water Transfer Project is truly a feat of engineering, however, it did not come without its challenges. Obviously, there is the controversy that is created within the environmental sphere first. The consequences of diverting rivers downstream have serious disruption to ecosystems and wildlife depending on such sources of water. An example with the Eastern Route, where water being transferred northwards led to less being available for those to the South, caused some regional tensions. Hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced by the project. To facilitate the new reservoirs, dams, and channels, the regimen had to shift entire communities. The Chinese government has compensated some, however, as told, their relocation has truly disrupted lives and cultures that have survived a number of centuries. Beside it also being so expensive, not only because the initial estimated cost of $62 billion, but also due to the long-term costs entailed in such complex infrastructure. The continuous water treatment, pollution control, and energy required to pump the water across such large distances all concomitantly combine to make this a project that will require massive investment for decades. Even against the backdrop of such challenges though, China is pressing on with a gigantic task in its development and efforts towards long-term sustainability. It is in this project that China has outlined a bigger perspective for securing its water future, the South to North Water Transfer Project. Still, other solutions such as desalination plants and better irrigation techniques to limit water waste are being invested in seriously by the government. The challenges, however, are expected to grow stronger with increased climate change. The rapid urbanization and industrialization of China will only raise more demand for water, making such projects as the South to North Water Transfer critical to the future of China. However, even with this mega project, China will have to continue innovating if it is going to balance its need for water with environmental sustainability. So, there you have it, the South to North Water Transfer Project, an out-of-this-world engineering wonder that may turn out to be the turning point in China's water crisis for decades to come. What do you think about this project? Might other countries take similar ideas and have a solution to their water issues? Let us know in the comments section below. If you enjoyed going deep into the details of one of the most ambitious infrastructure projects in the world, be sure to like, subscribe, and ring the notification bell for more amazing stories like this. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you in the next video. Speaking about massive projects, do you want to know about 5 massive stadiums that never became a reality? If so, be sure to check out this video to find out more.